Hey everyone, welcome back to Claire's Chronicles, where today is boring, so let's get exploring. I have a really cool article to share with you all today, so let's jump right in. I can't wait to read this to you all. It's from the Washington Times from April 1st, 1923. Super old article. And the title says, The Oldest Temple of Worship in the Whole Wide World. So let's go ahead and... Oh, actually I have the PDF. And it starts with, Interesting excavations in the Temple of the Moon God in ancient Ur, where 7,000 years ago, the priests originated the idea that crazy people were moonstruck. And that is why, to this day, we call the insane lunatics. It says the oldest temple in all the world has been uncovered by scientists of the University of Pennsylvania and the British Museum working together among the sand-covered ruins of the ancient city of Ur in Mesopotamia, not far from the mouth of the Euphrates River and close to the traditional site of the Garden of Eden. They have found a great hoard of jewels and golden ornaments in one chamber. The offerings of worshippers to the mighty moon god whose home it was. They have uncovered a huge courtyard, tiled and with the fragments of an altar, from which run elaborate gutters to carry off the blood of the sacrifices slaughtered on that altar. And they have found that old king, Nebuchadnezzar, who the Bible says, went about on all fours and ate grass, visited the temple to be cured of his insanity, and either in gratitude or as an advance payment, rebuilt one of its walls and gave an enormous treasure to the deity. We also read in Genesis that the great patriarch Abraham left Ur of the Chaldees at the instance of the god Jehovah, and upon his promise that from the seed of Abraham should spring a chosen people, the Jewish race. And I want to show a quick picture here. It says at the bottom left, the citadel or castle of Ur of the Chaldees, viewed from the southeast. Note how the sands of 7,000 years have covered up the ancient temple of the moon of God. And also at the top here, it says top left. Let me see if I could zoom in further. Yeah. Seal cylinder of the dynasty of Ur showing Sin, the moon god, approving a virgin who has been selected for sacrifice, which we'll get into later. It's really crazy. So where did we end off here? Okay. Oh, and also, by the way, I'd like to say this link will be in my bio if you'd like to open it and follow along. I thought that'd be a great idea, so I wanted to start noting that in the videos. In this temple at Ur was, the first, was first taught the superstition that insanity is caused by the moon. And, you know, I have a lot of friends who actually um, study um, astronomy and astrology, and um, they're pretty convinced that the moon cycles have a lot to do with human behavior and uh, vegetation, agriculture. It actually ties in a lot, and we'll get into that later in the article as well. And so thoroughly did these ancients impress the idea on the minds of humanity that our name for craziness, lunacy, comes from the Latin luna, the moon, and means literally moonness. The idea had a double purpose. It increased the awe and fear with which the moon guard was regarded, and it was profitable to the priests since people stricken with madness went, like old Nebuchadnezzar, and gave up vast sums to have the god take his curse off them. Let me make sure this is clear for you all. The temple was built, the scientists say, about 5,000 years B.C., before Christ, or 7,000 years ago. This is at least 1,000 years before the first Egyptian temple of which we have any dependable record, and 3,500 years before old King Tutankhamun. 
for close to 20 centuries, Ur has been desert-covered ruins. But for 40 centuries, the Church of Sin, or Nanar, the moon god, was called by both of these names, was used by his worshippers, a record of continuous service that no other church or temple or even religion in the world can touch. The Chaldeans were a Semitic people, probably closely related to the Babylonians. They came out of the home land in Arabia as early as 10,000 BC, some scientists think. The Babylonians came along later and there was a long warfare between the two civilizations, although they had practically the same gods and goddesses and the same religion. Sound familiar? At last, the Chaldeans were conquered definitely by Hammurabi, the mighty Babylonian king and the lawgiver. The two stocks finally merged as one. But the Chaldeans were considered great scientists, astronomers, magicians, and sorcerers. Priests were sent to Babylon from the temple at Ur to instruct. They were even called for by the Egyptians. There seems to be no doubt that they did have an extraordinary science and particularly a deep and curious knowledge of the principles and powers of light and the effects of colors upon the health of the mind and body, a lost science, some of whose secrets are just beginning to be rediscovered. Very cool. I know um, clairvoyance and things like that, they see auras around people and uh, how color can explain um, not only the personality, but the soul of a person. It's really cool, and I want to look into that a little bit more. It intrigued me when it said it's a lost science, and I wonder. Who knows? Um, this points out to a great image I'd like to reference. It says a modern priest of one of the Muslim tribes near ancient Ur performing one of the mysterious rites, which scientists say undoubtedly originated in the temple to the moon god. Here's that image. So let's pick up where we left off. But what was a Sunday service like in this old temple of the moon god? And why did the Chaldeans think of the moon as masculine and a god when almost all other ancient races held it to be feminine and a goddess? Even the popular songwriters of today call it Lady Moon. Answering the last question first, the Chaldeans were, as has been said, singularly advanced astronomers. They knew all about the moon's influence on the tides, and they believed, as do many farmers today, that it affects and actually governs the growth of vegetation. Comment below what you guys think. That's it's such a special part because I've read a lot about that, and I'm curious. And I know that when there's full moons, they're, they're named, certain names. I don't know right now, but I've looked into it and I thought it was so cool. They also thought that it controlled the rain. Even today, we speak of wet moons and dry moons. But more than that, the moon seemed to them to have more power than the sun. The sun had to go down into the land of darkness every night to sleep and be reborn. But the moon did not. It was strong enough to rule the night with all the evil spirits and lurkers in the blackness. Furthermore, the moon at certain seasons appeared in the day sky. If it was powerful enough to ride the heavens both day and night, while the sun could only ride them during the day, it followed that the moon must be stronger than the sun. And therefore, as the Chaldeans regarded all the strong deities as masculine, they figured that the moon must be a god and not a goddess. Services were held regularly every Sunday at the moon god's temple. Their Sabbaths fell upon the nights of the new moon, the first quarter, the full moon, and the last quarter. The first three services were joyous, the last a sorrowful one as befitting the waning brilliancy of the god. There were from time to time what might be called special services with special sacrifices and rites, and the temple itself was always open day and night to the worshippers. 
But these worshippers did not come to receive spiritual counsel, nor wise and holy guidance through some crisis. Nor did they come to confess or do penance for their sins, or to pray for their dead, or to contemplate their own hereafter. If they had done so, the priests of the moon god could not have helped them any. For in the first place they did not believe in any hereafter of rewards and punishments as we do. They recognized that there was something in man that lived on after death. But good and bad, rich and poor alike went to one place, a huge dark country presided over by the Lord of Death where the souls wandered about cold and hungry and twittering like birds. If this was so, there was, of course, no use in praying for the dead or thinking anything about so unpleasant a hereafter, which they were bound to get no matter what they did or didn't do. This naturally made them exceedingly anxious to get all the enjoyment and comfort they could out of this world. Therefore they went to the temple between services to have their fortunes told. This leads up to the fact that the moon god's temple was in effect an astronomical ob observatory. Besides being astronomers, the priests of Nanar were astrologers. They believed and taught that the stars ruled the destinies of all men. They therefore cast the horoscopes of the worshippers and told them whether they were going to be found out or not, whether the next year was going to be better or worse one, what was the lucky day to get married or divorced or go into business and so on. All this the priests told them for a consideration. When the stars left the issue undecided, the priests sold charms or made prayers to Nanar to bring it about favorably to the petitioner. Let's see if we can find, let me see what this, oh, this image is going to come up. When the temple was opened for the regular Sunday services, the congregation flocked into an enormous high-ceilinged room on whose walls were painted and carved terrifying monsters, symbolizations of constellations or grouping of stars, weird, half-human, half-animal, and winged figures. And I wanted to say this makes me think of the Lama Su in Assyrian culture. Um, it had the body of a bull, the wings of an eagle, and the head of a man. And it was known to protect the throne of the gods. Um, so I found that very interesting. Um, An astonishing and what would be to us today shocking objects representing certain attributes and functions of the god. There were no comfortable pews or seats. The congregation were either standing up or flat on their faces. There were no halfway measures such as kneeling. They had a choir just as we have. It was a large and interesting choir made up of the daughters of the finest richest Chaldean fam families. Sometimes a girl of extraordinary beauty and voice could get into it, but the job was such an honorable one that usually there was little room for anyone who could not pay well. There is an actual hymn, hymn sung by this choir in the old moon god's temple which has come down to us and has been translated from the brick slabs which took the place then of our modern neat choral hymnals. In reading this over, it will be readily seen just why the Chaldeans conceived the moon to be masculine and not feminine, and why they thought he was so powerful. It has been translated in part thus. O Lord, chief of the gods, who on earth and in heaven alone is exalted, Father Nanad, Lord of Increase, Chief of the Gods. Father Nanad, Lord of the Ur, Chief of the Gods. Father Nanad, who passes along in great majesty. In heaven, who is exalted? Thou alone art exalted. On earth, who is exalted? Thou alone art exalted. 
Thy strong command on high, like a storm in the darkness, passes along, and nourishment streams forth. When thy strong command is established on the earth, vegetation sprouts forth. Thy strong command stretches over meadows and heights, and life is increased. Thy strong command produces right and proclaims justice to mankind. Thy strong command through the distant heavens and the wide earth extends to whatever it is. Can you imagine how beautiful this sounded in the true language? Thy strong command, who can grasp it? Who can rival it? O king of kings, who has no judge superior to him, whose divinity is not surpassed by any other. At these services, the sacrifices consisted of burnt offerings, of animals and flowers and fruits. From time to time, however, it would seem that now and then, special popular services were held when a human being, either a fair maiden or unblemished ancestry or a youth, was sacrificed. Let me move my camera here because this is a very special part. Okay, that's better. Move this too. And it appeared certain from fragments of the ancient brick tablets on which the Chaldeans, like the Babylonians, wrote, and also from some legends, that human sacrifice played a part in one very curious ceremony, which was carried on at the beginning of the seasons, four times a year. This latter ceremony was an extraordinarily sacred one. Only the highest priests of Chaldea and of Ur, the king and his greatest generals, and now and then visiting kings, high priests or generals were allowed to take part in it. According to the vague descriptions that exist, there was a holy of holies, a room held sacred to the presence of the moon god himself, and in which something of him was supposed to dwell at all times. There was a shaft in the wall fitted, it would seem, oh, this is a very cool part, with mirrors arranged much on the principle of the refracting telescope of today which I've read a lot about this, that um, rulers back in the day would, would set a window in a certain point to where the sun would shine and they would invite the people of the town and it, the sun would shine down on them and make them look super powerful. They really studied light back in the day. Um, let's see. Okay, there was an empty throne which faced the inner end of this shaft or rude telescope. When the full moon was in a direct line with the outer opening of the shaft, its image was taken up by the little mirrors and reflected back on the throne. And reflected on the back of the throne. This back was apparently made of some reflecting material, cunningly shaped and probably with some powers of reflection and magnification that we do not now understand. At any rate, when the moon shone through the shaft, its image was cast by the mirrors on the back of the throne, which then became luminous and appeared to be filled with a great globe of moonlight. The effect was, no doubt, accentuated by other tricks and devices which the Chaldeans had worked out in their minute study of light. When the moon then literally took his seat on the throne in his Holy of Holies, the sacrifice of a virgin was made at the altar, close beside the throne itself. After the girl had been slain, her brain, heart, liver, and several other organs were examined for omens or signs which were supposed to reveal infallible secret rulings of the moon god upon the destinies of Chaldea. Its great ones, its friends, its enemies and the destinies of the great ones from other countries who had been asked to the ceremony. This cruel and bloody rite was not, however, used generally, and it is likely that it occurred even in the Holy of Holies not more than once a year. There was another very remarkable phase of the religious life at Ur. 
unmarried women of the upper class were under certain circumstances entitled to hold property in their own names and engage in commercial undertakings. To secure such a position, a woman had to take vows, by which she became a member of what were called vato, vatar, let's just say vataris, vataris, yeah. If she desired to do so, she could leave the community house of the Vatari and contract a form of marriage. But here her penalties began to appear. Even when she was married, a Vatari was still ob obliged to remain a virgin. And should her husband desire children, she could not have them herself. She must provide him with a substitute. Nevertheless, in spite of this disability, she was secured in her position as head of the household. The substitute, though she might have children, was always the wife's inferior, and should she attempt to put herself on a level with the wife, the latter could brand her and put her with the female slaves. A very high standard of social morality was expected from these votaries, and severe penalties were imposed for its infringement. What other astonishing revelations of this worship in the ancient city of Ur of the Chaldean science will bring to light is a fascinating thing to consider. And fascinating it is. Let me zoom out now. There's another image I wanted to show you guys. Um, this is a painting, it says. Um, let me zoom in here first. A remarkable painting by Eduard Vim Vimont of an oracle in ancient Gaul in which the Druid priestess performed the human sacrifice and then prophesied as to the future, basing her fortune-telling on the manner in which the victim died and on the condition of his vital organs, much as did the Chaldean worshippers of the moon god in their day. Here's the painting. Let me move my... So really crazy. Let me see if I can zoom in. And here it says on the right, view of the tile flooring, all that remains of the once magnific magnificent throne hall in the temple of Ur, underneath which excavators have just unearthed a great hoard of jewels which were offered by worshippers to the moon god. Oh my gosh, when I first read this article, I almost couldn't believe it. Um, but... It is very cool, and it, here, oh, there's one more image that I wanted to talk about. It says, tablet found in the Temple of Ur, showing the new moon conquering the old, or black moon, and at the right, the Chaldean symbol for Taurus, or the bull, which was supposed to give strength to the moon. So, this is the article of the night. I hope you all enjoyed it. I found it super interesting. If you have any comments, leave them below. I would really love a discussion about this. There is just so much we talked about. And um, I, I hope you guys enjoyed it. And if you did, please subscribe and like the channel. It helps a lot. It makes me feel good. Um, but yeah, I will see you all next time. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend. And I'll see you at the next article. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.